Mysticism is the art of union with reality. The mystic is a person who has attained that union in greater or less degree, or who aims at and believes in such attainment. It is not expected that the inquirer will find great comfort in this sentence when it first meets his eye. The ultimate question, what is reality, a question perhaps which never occurred to him before, is already forming in his mind, and he knows that it will cause him infinite distress. Only a mystic can answer it, and he in terms which other mystics alone will understand. Therefore, for the time being, the practical man may put it on one side. All that he is asked to consider now is this, that the word union represents not so much a rare and unimaginable operation as something which he is doing in a vague, imperfect fashion at every moment of his conscious life, and doing with intensity and thoroughness in all the more valid moments of that life. We know a thing only by uniting with it by assimilating it, by an interpenetration of it and ourselves. It gives itself to us just in so far as we give ourselves to it. The great Sufi who said that pilgrimage to the place of the wise is to escape the flame of separation spoke the literal truth. Wisdom is the fruit of communion. Ignorance the inevitable portion of those who keep themselves to themselves and stand apart judging, analyzing the things which they have never truly known. Real knowledge, since it always implies an intuitive sympathy, more or less intense, is far more accurately suggested by the symbols of touch and taste than by those of hearing and sight. True analytic thought follows swiftly upon the contact, the apprehension, the union, and we, in our muddle-headed way, have persuaded ourselves that this is the essential part of knowledge, that it is, in fact, more important to cook the hare than to catch it. But when we get rid of this illusion and go back to the more primitive activities through which our mental kitchen gets its supplies, we see that the distinction between mystic and non-mystic is not merely that between the rationalist and the dreamer, between intellect and intuition, the question which divides them is really this. What, out of the massive material offered to it, shall consciousness seize upon? With what aspects of the universe shall it unite? It is notorious that the operations of the average human consciousness unite with the self, not with things as they really are, but with images, notions, aspects of things. The verb to be, which he uses so lightly, does not truly apply to any of the objects amongst which the practical man supposes himself to dwell. For him, the hair of reality is always a ready jug. He conceives not the living, lovely, wild, swift moving creature which has been sacrificed in order that he may be fed on the deplorable dish which he calls things as they are. So complete, indeed, is the separation of his consciousness from the facts of being that he feels no sense of loss. He is happy enough understanding, garnishing, assimilating the carcass from which the principle of life and growth has been ejected, and whereof only the most digestible portions have been retained. He is not mystical. But sometimes it is suggested to him that his knowledge is not quite so thorough as he supposed. Philosophers in particular have a way of pointing out its clumsy and superficial character, of demonstrating the fact that he habitually mistakes his own private sensations for qualities inherent in the mysterious objects of the external world. Because mystery is horrible to us, we have agreed for the most part to live in a world of labels, to make of them the current coin of experience, and ignore their merely symbolic character. 
we simply do not attempt to unite with reality. But now and then, the symbolic character is suddenly brought home to us. Some great emotion, some devastating visitation of beauty, love, or pain, lifts us to another level of consciousness. And we are aware, for a moment, of the difference between the neat collection of discrete objects and experiences which we call the world, and the height, the depth, the breadth of that living, growing, changing fact, of which thought, life, and energy are parts, and in which we live and move and have our being. Therefore, it is to a practical mysticism that the practical man is here invited, to a training of his latent faculties, a bracing and brightening of his languid consciousness, an emancipation from the fetters of appearance, a turning of his attention to new levels of the world. Thus, he may become aware of the universe which the spiritual artist is always trying to disclose to the race. This amount of mystical perception this ordinary contemplation, as the specialists call it, is possible to all men. Without it, they are not wholly conscious, nor wholly alive. It is a natural human activity, no more involving the great powers and sublime experiences of the mystical saints and philosophers than the ordinary enjoyment of music involves the special creative powers of the great musician. As the beautiful does not exist for the artist and poet alone, though these can find in it more poignant depths of meaning than other men, so the world of reality exists for all, and all may participate in it, unite with it, according to their measure and to the strength and purity of their desire. <laughs>